Well, folks, I think we've got a pretty um, a packed agenda and a, a one that includes, and I appreciate folks that were able to join us. It looks like most people are joining us with their computers because I think we're gonna have a, a neat interactive tool to start building our uh, um, goals and objectives. So um, I think we need to turn it over to our chair and he can um, start. start well, Steve. good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, I've had a glimpse of what we're going to be talking about tonight or this morning. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Um, I think the goal for today is to get everybody up to speed and to get that interaction. So hopefully uh, after today's uh, presentation, we'll get that interaction because that's what's needed now to continue to move the water marketing program forward. So I'll turn it back over to Aaron and he can be the master of the event. Master of ceremonies I shall be. Um, again, welcome everybody uh, and committee members. Um, I think I'll have Jeremy go through the um, I'll just have them on the side, go through and, and get a roll. But I think I see most of our members here already and a lot of the public. So welcome to this, this discussion. Um, I think what best is at this point, our consultants have, and I and, and uh, Steve have gone through and uh, structured a, a, a day here, a couple hours maybe of discussion. And we also will be including conversations with our um, consultants that are assisting the GSAs and where their roles are gonna be here with this water marketing strategy because they're gonna be supporting uh, GSA work. And then as we build this water marketing strategy, we wanna make sure it's all kind of paired together nice and, and uh, efficient. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Matthew. Do you wanna take it from here? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so just looking at the agenda here, there's really two primary goals for today. Um, uh, first, as, a, as an update, uh, there are, uh, as when you look at the original scope of work uh, laid out for the water marketing strategy, uh, there is the involvement of um, uh, three different teams, the Stantec consulting team, as well as legal and engineering teams. And those three teams have now met formally uh, have reviewed the scope of work, uh, identified roles and responsibilities, and have begun the coordination of producing various work products that will all be inputs to the final water marketing strategy. And so we wanted to share with you an update, um, uh, uh, review our understanding of the scope of work and talk about that coordination and how each of the work products of the various teams will be inputs to your decisions about um, uh, the final water marketing strategy. Uh, so that update will come first. Uh, and then uh, after doing that, after reviewing that, uh, we want to really start to build a framework to guide that will guide decision making about specific elements of the water marketing strategy. So just as a 30,000 foot view, what we, what our, we plan to do um, is to review existing water markets uh, and to build a, a list, you know, a menu, think of it as a menu of specific strategies, rules, procedures um, that are used in other water markets, existing water markets, to then um, use input from the legal and engineering teams to call that menu to a series of choices. And then we'll need a systematic way um, uh, for the committee to make decisions, you know, to prioritize one um, set of strategies over another. And so we're gonna, we hope to start that today by, you know, starting to um, identify explicit goals and objectives that we hope to achieve, what we hope to achieve and what we hope to avoid uh, with the water marketing strategy. So we'll start to lay that out today. Uh, and so that's really, those two things um, are the plan. Uh, so uh, if we jump to the next slide, we'll move on to the legal and engineering elements. Oh, and actually Craig, do you wanna talk about this real quick? Yeah, just a quick note to everyone. As Aaron mentioned earlier, we're gonna have a um, electronic kind of jam board session we're collecting everyone's ideas and options to be questions in today's workshop. And so Craig, we're having trouble hearing you. You're jumping in and out. Okay, sorry about that. Let me go and just turn off my monitor. 
So um, just a quick heads up that we'll be doing a part of this workshop will be conducted by Jamboard and the address to participate in it is here on the screen. I've also added it into the uh, chat room. So when we get to that at the end, um, this will be an opportunity for you to share anonymously or you know, if you want to put your initials into the comments, your ideas, thoughts on certain uh, topics. And then we'll have a discussion around those items um, for the rest of the uh, meeting. I hand it back to you, Matthew. Great, thanks, Craig. You can go and move on. All right, um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so, just as a reminder, this is a a, uh, a graphic that we've shown in previous committee committee meetings and in, in the the most recent committee meeting. Uh, and this lays out the scope of work uh, for the various teams producing in uh, currently the plan is in Q4 2022 um, a uh, an interim water marketing strategy that will be used going forward. Uh, and so today, what we hope to uh, focus uh, discussion on are the light blue uh, bars on this uh, timeline. And these are the specific um, work products that the legal and engineering teams will be working on. So the legal team is working on 2.1, analyzing water rights, uh, and 3.1, a legal framework for a water marketing strategy. And then the engineering team um, uh, will be working on 2.3 and 2.4, uh, uh, which we'll get into. That involves developing, refining a groundwater model, developing, a rev um, updating the water budget and water accounting framework in support of producing an allocation that can be used as the basis for a water marketing strategy. So we'll talk about each of those three. It's really today's discussion will focus on those uh, three light blue sections. Craig, you can go to the next slide. Right, so in terms of the legal team, uh, and I should add that uh, we'll actually have a representative of the legal team here um, in about, hopefully in the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And so I'm gonna touch on this briefly um, and in this order only because um, this is one of the, the uh, earliest uh, work products that needs to be worked on. Uh, and then hopefully Valerie will be joining us uh, to provide her comments and to answer any questions that committee members might have. So the legal team is working on two specific um, elements of the water marketing strategy. I mentioned these on the previous slide, analyzing water rights within the water marketing strategy and developing a legal framework. And really 2.1 really? is the, um, the more difficult of these two. 3.1 3 is just developing the various administrative steps, ordinances, participation agreements, uh, and other um, administrative tools that are needed to implement the water marketing strategy. But 2.1 will involve um, some uh, significant decisions for the water marketing strategy committee um, to, dis, uh, um, to implement. Uh, so uh, very briefly, 2.1 as currently envisioned uh, involves developing a framework for understanding the relationship between water rights and transfers of allocation within the water marketing strategy. Uh, and so, <clears throat> This involves identifying potential parameters for transferring allocation among all three buckets in the water accounting framework, native, foreign, and salvaged water. Uh, and the legal team has told us that they do believe it is possible to trade within each of those three buckets, but that there are risks inherent in each of those categories. And so they'll be, um, I, first of all, defining parameters and then identifying risks um, so that the water marketing strategy committee can decide uh, what exactly will be traded. So briefly, if you go to the next slide, Valerie will elaborate on this next one. Um, Craig, I actually want you to go to the next one. I'll let her talk about that. But really the, dis the decisions that need to be made are who is eligible to participate uh, in a uh, water market or a GSA to adopt the water marketing strategy. What is it that traded? What that's traded? What are the geographic and other limitations on trade? And when you know are these temporary transfers, permanent transfers? What are the temporal boundaries? Uh, and so, um, the legal team will be providing guidance on those uh, various parameters and sort of laying out a series of um, 
decisions for the committee to make. So without much further ado, I, I mean, I, I would normally ask if there's questions, but I really want to wait until Valerie's here so she can lead a uh, richer, deeper discussion. So let's jump to the engineering. Hey, uh, Matthew, yeah, really there. quick, I probably ought to let the committee know that that the managers have also the, the three GSAs tried to, to get together and figure out how we infuse the our, our legal teams and our consultants. And for the legal team perspective, each GSA uh, is gonna make their legal counsel available. So if you think about how, while you're hearing from Valerie from here forward, there may be a spokesperson from the legal team, but each attorney will be participating equally in the, the efforts here. Um, so you're getting three of the most talented uh, water rights folks helping us put this water marketing strategy together here in the Kuya subbasin. So uh, mid Kuya is making Valerie Kincaid available. East Kuya is making Joe Hughes available. He's a Kern County attorney. Uh, I, I think he's in Kern County. And then um, um, Aubrey Moritzen, uh, who's a local um, um, here in the Kuya subbasin. So those three will be helping us. And on the engineering team side, uh, we'll be infusing Provost and Pritchard and Montgomery Associates, um, and we'll each be covering additional workload that they may need to do to help us and sharing in those costs. Um, so it won't be the water marketing strategy team's um, concern. We'll we'll cover that from the GSA's perspective. So just to, wanted to make sure you guys are aware of that. And actually, Aaron, thank you for that. To to elaborate just a little bit um, uh, to restate and make very clear something Aaron already said, which is that the, each of the three GSA um, council will be involved in the entire work of the, of the legal team. So that's to say the three GSAs will have equal participation um, in that. And what that legal team is doing is they're writing two written chapters of the final water marketing strategy. One, understanding uh, water rights within the context of uh, the water marketing strategy and the other developing those administrative steps to authorize uh, a market. So written chapters, again, will present the committee with a series of choices, uh, decisions to be made regarding what the final strategy looks like. Um, hey, and uh, Aaron, that since you uh, mentioned Provost and Pritchard and Montgomery and Associates, would it be valuable really quickly to introduce, since we're moving to the engineering team, we actually have four representatives of that engineering team here should we have them introduce themselves real quick before we move on yeah i think that's that's appropriate why don't we start with uh, the first one i see on my list right now is tim leo hello uh, good morning everybody uh, my name is tim leo i'm a hydrogeologist with montgomery associates and uh we've been working uh in in this sub basin for a little while now um supporting Aaron on a, on a variety of things and also the all the GSAs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about what we've been focusing on in our recent work. Um, how about next? I see Derek with Montgomery and Associates. Hi, everybody. I'll just introduce myself quickly. I'm also a hydrogeologist uh, with Montgomery and Associates working out of our San Luis Obispo office. And Tim and I will be working together on the groundwater modeling and water budgeting. And then our Provost and Pritchard team. Hi, uh, this is Matt Clinchew, um, engineering consultant with PMP, been involved with all three of the GSAs and probably several others and uh, different projects and so helping um, with that largely on the water budget side. Hi, I'm Morgan Campbell, environmental specialist with Provon Pritchard and assisting Matt behind the scenes on all those items. Terrific, thanks so much. Um, so uh, in the original scope of work that was laid out, um, there were uh, 2.3 and 2.4 were planning activities to be undertaken by the engineering team. And those were originally defined as, as uh, identifying potential buyers and sellers and establishing water exchange quantities. So that was the original language uh, in the scope of work. Uh, and really uh, uh, what the teams are doing, as you see here, are refining the groundwater model. So there's a GSP water model, uh, but they'll be refining that groundwater model. And you'll get some updates here on what that work is and the timeline for completing that, updating the water budget and water accounting framework 
so that an allocation system can be um, uh, defined uh, in support of the water marketing strategy. And an allocation, um, you know, actually assigning, uh, pumping, uh, and other water allocations to individuals is a prerequisite for implementing a water market of any kind. And so you see here the engineering teams at a high level will be defining individual pumpers access to native foreign and salvaged water. Uh, and so at a very basic level, helping with that, um, uh, defining that access, but at the same time, identifying for uh, the Stantec team and for the water market uh, strategy committee, uh, who are potential buyers and sellers? We want, early on in the process, we want input uh, providing guidance about where we expect transfers to happen, who might be potential buyers within each category, who are potential sellers. Uh, and the goal there is to try and start to uh, think about uh, likely patterns of transfers of allocation, and then to anticipate um, the consequences of those transfers. Because one of the things that the water marketing strategy must do um, is actually address potential impacts to third parties and to mitigate those impacts. And so you see here, after defining uh, individual pumpers access and identifying potential buyers and sellers, um, one of the goals that the engineering team will have is will be to provide guidance regarding the definition of you know, potential geographic and other limitations on transfers uh, in order to mitigate uh, impacts. Uh, and so with that, let's move on to the next slide. And I'm gonna pass it off um, to Tim and Derek to discuss the engineering team's uh, work that's already underway. All right, I'll take this uh, slide. Derek, please chime in if, uh, if needed. Uh, so uh, as I indicated, we've been working uh, for the last six, seven months, uh, looking at the, uh, the groundwater model and, and, and the water budgets and uh, completed that, that evaluation. Um, and what this graphic here on this slide shows is just kind of the basic outcome of our, our look at the groundwater model. So the groundwater model that exists was built for the GSP and, and served its purpose for development of the GSP, but for supporting uh, implementing the water accounting framework going forward, we, we recommended some changes to the model structure as this graphic shows, just to parse out a bit the output side of the groundwater model um, so that it can more easily support the work going forward with the water accounting framework and, and the water marketing strategy. And, and, and uh, so it'll, it, that work will occur uh, starting next year after we get through some additional work. And I believe that's uh, summarized on the, on the next slide. Craig, do you want to bump us along? Next slide, please. So, um, so the plan going forward is that uh, we're uh, at the beginning of uh, some additional work here to um, to take a look at the water budgets, um, uh, uh, update those water budgets, I think through 2021, I believe we're gonna work closely with Provost and Pritchard on that work. They're gonna be the lead of that work and we'll support that. And then at that, it, and then towards the middle end of that effort, we're, we'll have a better understanding of how those water budgets uh, were built and, and, and we'll prepare a, a, a plan for the GSAs of how we uh, see uh, refining the, the groundwater model. And, and at that point, we'll have a better idea of what that looks like and how we can best develop that model for the water marketing uh, efforts that, that loom ahead. And so that's going to start probably in the Q2 time frame of 2022, um, the work on the model, and we hope to get it, uh, get it mostly done uh, through into Q4 of 2022. Um, as we as we work through the efforts to to get it prepared for supporting long term groundwater management in the basin, in fact, um, but really initially to support the water marketing efforts, um, and so that uh, that's our plan for 2022 with respect to the groundwater model. Terrific, and obviously the refinement of the groundwater model will then lead to um, updating uh, the water budgets. So while the water budget is an input to that uh, groundwater model. Uh, it'll also result in uh, updating those water budgets and an updating of the water accounting framework um, yeah. by the end of, um, 
2022. So um, actually, if we go to the next slide, it might be, I, I, Craig, there's, a, there's sort of a graphic of the basic time, the basic uh, conceptual workflow. And also this, this one um, uh, might be a good opportunity to ask the committee if they have questions. But what you see here is just a real simple conceptual model. So that re refinement of that ground model will result in revisions to the water budget and a water accounting framework. That final water accounting framework will uh, be the basis for an allocation system, which as I mentioned already is a prerequisite for um, the water marketing strategy. So real quick for the committee, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I, let me also just add as, a, as my own comment that, um, that obviously to state the obvious, the work that the engineering team is doing is necessary, is already underway, whether there is a water marketing strategy or not. But that work, that necessary work that they are doing is an important input to the water, to a, a water marketing strategy. So any questions from the from uh, committee members about that, what that work is that the engineering team is doing? And then I'll try and tie it back to the water marketing strategy in a moment. I guess for the committee, I'd like to just add some context too, because some may be wondering, well, well, you're doing this now. How, how did you, what, how did you get to the GSP without that? I thought we had a water budget and a, a model and we, and for the committee's information, we did, um, as we created the GSP, we had uh, established a water budget. It's in our GSP. It was largely based on a spreadsheet table and a water budget, uh, um, document your inputs and, and outputs to the groundwater system. Um, however, the, the GSAs are looking for a little bit more robust tool under implementation, and which helps do certain projects like the water marketing strategy. So the Provost and Pritchard team is, is our local civil engineering firm that knows the inputs and the outputs. So they're the ones working on the water budget that will then inform a new uh, mod flow model, which is a numeric model, um, but that numeric model that was developed in 2020 supported the development of a GSP, but as we dug into that model, it didn't support um, the, the new implementation projects that we were looking to uh, venture on, which is the water accounting framework and, and a water marketing strategy. So the GSAs are um, committed to the uh, kind of a, a more robust mod flow model that can manage our needs into the future. And so that's why we've contracted with Montgomery Associates and Provost and Pritchard to update all of that. Um, not, not necessarily recreate all of it because we've done it, but just update it to the, to a more modern useful tool. And, um, we believe it's, it's a good move for this sub basin. Excellent. Everyone does want to make a comment. We do have everyone muted. So just uh, self unmute and then uh, go and ask your question or, or comment. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, um, either Matthew or Aaron, would it be possible for the to get the existing model now so we can see how it evolves through this process? Okay. Uh, to get the, what was that, Chuck, to get the model or? Well, you said that we're updating the existing model. Is it possible to um, have that for the committee to have that now to see it so we can see how it changes as this process goes forward? It's not really a physical document or, or physical, yeah, it's not, it, put it this way, the mod flow model resides within our hydrogeologist uh, <laughs> realm. It's, it's a, it's a tool that they use that is not one that you just kind of uh, can make available. Uh, the outputs can be made available, meaning when you make a model run, you can make the hydrographs and other things available, but, but per se, the model is not available unless you're kind of a hydrogeologist with a mod flow background. I could be wrong, right, Tim? Is that well? I mean, the, the, yeah, the file certainly could be provided. I mean, or 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 maybe better, we could certainly set up a time to sh you know talk more about you know what it what the model looks like, how how is it constructed, what's it based on, and how do we how do we envision it's going to evolve in this process? We certainly could do that to support that information transfer if needed. Um, 
but the physical files can, you know can can be provided there there and if you have somebody that's that can that can work with those files uh, that certainly can be done and and would it do i understand tim that uh, that there is and, and aaron that there is a preliminary there's a gsp water budget and the preliminary water accounting framework and after the model has been refined there will be a revised water budget and a revised accounting framework that could be compared more or less side by side correct yeah, correct. And Chuck, I think that probably the best I can do for you or get you so that you have a starting point and then you can do a comparison point is what I can do is package the information for the committee that's in the current GSP. So you'll have baseline 2020. And then when we get the output, you'll, you'll see the, the new output. So I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, Jeremy do that for you. We'll pull the sections out of the GSP that have the water budget and uh, maybe some of the water um, model outputs, the hydrographs, so you'll have the starting point. That's, that's I did a very poor job of asking for it, but that's what I was asking for. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, and actually, Aaron, that that highlights, you know, uh, what what we need to do for this committee is also create, you know, a, a SharePoint site or something where all of this inform, you know, all of this information can be aggregated so that we can refer back to it at various times. Great. All right. We'll, we'll get on that, Chuck. Um, I'll, I have it on my to-do list now. Great. All right. So, uh, Craig, can you go? Oh, actually, I'll, I'll pause. Are there any other follow-up questions? Great. All right. And so one of the things I wanted to acknowledge uh, and, again, present to the committee um, ultimately as a, as a uh, decision point is that uh, since the original scope of work was outlined in the um, request for proposals when um, seeking a consultant to help uh, guide the water marketing strategy development. Uh, there have been some changes. Uh, obviously we're confronting um, tremendous water scarcity with the drought right now. Uh, and at various points in the process of applying, talking to the water marketing committee um, and, and in early committee meetings, there seem to develop a sense of urgency, right? That, that the nice linear path to a water marketing strategy originally identified in the scope of work um, may not be quick enough. So if you think about what we just laid out, um, we would have revised water budget and water accounting framework at the very end of 2022. Uh, the development of an allocation system can, be, can actually be contentious and um, time consuming. Uh, and that's a necessary input to the water marketing strategy. And so as you think about that original timeline, you know, we were looking at a, at a water marketing strategy document um, well into 2023. Uh, and there is some urgency to try and create flexibility now um, or as soon as possible. Uh, and so one of the things that we've discussed um, is uh, sort of parallel paths. So at the same time that that uh, work is being done by the engineering team. Uh, and as they're preparing their chapters of the water marketing strategy, um, is that it is possible to um, also have a parallel path that at the same time that that important work is being done, um, that we could uh, use the existing uh, water model used in the GSP, the water budget and the water accounting framework outlined there and the emergency allocation that's being developed in the face of the current drought, uh, the allocation that's being developed uh, a little differently at each of the GSPs, the GSAs, uh, but we could use those things as the basis for um, a series of uh, test markets, you know, simple pilot markets that have a definitive starting and ending point that are an interim um, tool uh, and that a development of some test markets yeah, um, could actually then be allow us to test alternative strategies, learn about possible unintended consequences of transfers, uh, and then actually do some learning so that those lessons can be inputs to the final water marketing strategy. Uh, and so this is one that has been discussed, uh, that the committee discussed with us, um, uh, with the, the Stantec team 
um, going back several months. Uh, but this is a you know something we want the, the committee to uh, you know sort of keep top of mind uh, and um, uh, that as that if, that with this alternate path leading to some test markets that would actually allow test markets to be implemented perhaps in the 2023 water year um, to give water users um, additional flexibility and again to learn um, and so um, and this is one you know a decision point for the committee uh, that they'll need to address in the weeks and months ahead and then reevaluate uh, is this the path that the committee wants to continue on uh, and so um, Aaron, I was sort of hoping you would, um, um, you know, uh, this this alternative workflow sort of emerged, you know, I would guess last fall as we were confronting the drought. Uh, and so uh, do you have any comments on that? I think, yeah, the, the most poignant comment I, I want to add to this is probably that as many of us are in the midst of talking about current this emergency allocation process, groundwater caps, and other items, we don't want to confuse the work that we're doing here, which is the ultimate water marketing strategy. So the three GSAs are developing um, programs to limit groundwater pump, pumping in the face of current drought conditions, but it is not the water marketing strategy. And we need to continue that messaging so that when we get uh, through 2022, um, we can begin to uh, signal to folks that here's where we're at with the water marketing strategy. And hopefully at that point, we're ready to implement in 2023, some sort of localized testing of the market where we can see where, how the Kuya subbasin reacts to exchanges. And we can test the, the uh, concepts that you as a committee decide to put in place. Let, let's just use, for example, a, a distance transfer limit or, or no limit if you decide that. And we can run that in the 2023 scenario and go, well, you know, that worked great or that has some, look, that transfer uh, caused some precipitous declines over in another area. We probably ought to revisit that. So that's kind of the approach to this revised strategy in the face of emergency allocations. So the messaging we need to be sending, if you guys are comfortable with this is, as you develop your emergency allocations, um, what's developed within that is not a water market. It's what we want to term like flexible flexibility. Um, so folks can move some water around, but not under a water marketing strategy. Is that, I, I think that's what I want to add to this conversation here. But this is a good point where if the committee has any concerns with this process, this is kind of where we're headed. Any comments or questions from the committee? This is Sophie. Um, I think that it's really important to get that out there because what I keep hearing is, well, wait, there's this market strategy thing, Sophie, but we're already setting that up in our GSAs. What Are we just going to ignore the marketing? And then I've heard, well, we can look at it when they're finished doing all the work and we'll decide if we want to change or what. So I think getting that out there in the way you just described it, Aaron, is really, really, really important. Good point, Sophie. And I, I think Eric's on the on the line here. I, I know I've heard him uh, just recently explain, and I do it the same. We'll we'll continue that that same messaging that we are not developing a water market underneath the emergency allocation. We're providing growers with flexibility to address an annual concern, but if they're going to want to move water in the future, it goes through the water marketing strategy, which is being developed currently. And, and one of the things that I've seen in other basins uh, that I would sort of warn about is that, uh, you know, obviously allocations can have flexibility within the allocation system. And allocation flexibility is very different than a market where there's actual market transfers. One person has a little unused allocation and they actually make that available and are financially remuner remunerated for making that available. You know, a market system is different than simple allocation flexibility. The challenge is that um, uh, the water marketing strategy as outlined by the committee 
anticipates a, at least the strategy development, anticipates a very thoughtful, measured approach, right? Where there will be considerations for the environment, considerations for shallow municipal wells, concern about um, negative, potential negative impacts of market transfers. Uh, with all of that thought and care going into the water marketing strategy, you, you do have to worry about um, uh, implementing the same care in any allocation flexibility. Uh, you know, you, what you don't want is a system where in the, in the difficult days of a drought, you develop emergency allocations with lots of flexibility where people can transfer allocation um, you know, in an unregulated fashion and possibly impact, you know, impose some of the impacts that you worried about within a water marketing framework. Again, impacts to the environment, impacts to shallow municipal wells, other third parties. Uh, because uh, if you're giving all that flexibility in the face of the drought, you know, growers are, and other water users, stakeholders are not likely to implement a water marketing strategy that has that is much more um, tightly regulated. You know, the argument you're likely to hear is, well, if that was good enough during the drought, why isn't it good enough in an average rainfall year? Right? Why do we need to go to this much, much more restrictive system? Uh, and, and you're likely to not have widespread um, stakeholder support of the final water market strategy. I've also, the, that SOPI, I've had some growers call me too with that same concern is that, well, you're, you're allowing us uh, to market water under these emergency. So that's um, where they want to head. And I said, that's not where you want to head because these are emergency allocation or emergency ordinances that we're putting in place that literally have a one year lot shelf life. And then they will probably be uh, modified to a pretty significant extent based upon the outcomes. And I said, if you, the water marketing strategy provides a platform under which you can be fairly confident, much more confident that you're not going to be challenged on, on the movement of the water. If you do it unregulated, it's, it's, it's on shaky ground at any given point in time because you're not considering all, all the potential ramifications of the market. What we're doing here, we're going to try and eliminate all the risk that's, or as much of the risk that's out there for the interested parties. And that includes agriculture. Like I, one grower said, well, just let us move it. And I said, we can allow you to move it only to take it away tomorrow. And that's not in your best interest. You need it to be in place for the next 20 to 30 years minimum in order to survive Sigma. And so that grower uh, kind of backed down and said, no, I get why, why you want to develop a, a structured system, which we, we can have a guarantee that it works for everybody. So that that's what we're tasked with here. So, but I, I get it, Sophie. I think we as the GSA manager needs to clearly delineate um, what the ordinance is intended to do and what the water marketing strategy intends to do and that they're um, not the same. Can I just make one other, other comment? Um, <clears throat> I'm involved with some um, ranching entities over in Ventura or farming. And one of the things that they've realized over there with Fox Canyon, which I'm sure Matthew, you're more than familiar with, um, is that the, to do to guarantee, like you just said, 25 years of this is the way it's going to work with climate change. That's not true. And there, there are always these unintended consequences that they're finding. Like we thought the water would go this direction. It doesn't really go that direction. So I would also be concerned that we were putting forward something of you can buy or sell your water for 25 years and it's all fine because <clears throat> that very well may not <clears throat> be the way that it turns yeah, out. No, I'm not a doctor. And I'm yeah. not a healer. And I think I was put on this earth to make this movie and to help others and hopefully sorry. Get into the <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, so Sophie, um, I, I think those comments are really valuable and I would encourage you, let's revisit those comments uh, when we get to the discussion of goals and objectives and make sure that those are uh, represented. All right, so um, so currently the 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 engineering and Stantec teams are proceeding with this parallel track, um, uh, with these parallel tracks in mind. Uh, and so 
The idea is that we that the current workflow could result in a, in test markets in early 2023 if the water marketing strategy committee committee chose to um, recommend those to GSAs. Uh, and, um, uh, and and so now I want to take a step back. So first of all, that's one for the committee just to be conscientious of uh, is that that this that there are different approaches, but this is the one we're currently on, uh, and we welcome feedback and input to that. Now, how all of this is going to work um, in terms of the uh, engineering and legal team deliverables. Uh, and so to repeat what I said earlier, the chapters that the legal and engineering teams are preparing are inputs to the, first of all, you know, actual inputs to the water marketing strategy document. But more importantly, they are intended to inform the menu of choices that will be presented to the water marketing uh, strategy committee. Uh, on specific terms, standards, rules, and procedures, right? So just think big picture, we're gonna be developing a menu of these things, terms, standards, rules, and procedures from existing water markets uh, with advice from the legal team and the engineering team. Some of those may be called, some of those uh, various uh, approaches implemented elsewhere just won't be applicable to the conditions on the ground uh, in the Kuya Subbasin, and so that uh, menu will be uh, reduced and ultimately a series of a menu of choices will be presented to the committee in each of these areas. What's the program period for trading? What is the unit, you know, uh, getting back to how the legal team frame this, the, uh, who can participate? What is it that's traded? Um, when, what's the term of trades? Where, what, what are the geographic and other limitations on trading? Uh, and so ultimately that will lead to a series of choices as the committee makes decisions in each of these areas, that will form the basis for the final water marketing strategy. Um, you know, and this will actually be you know, an outline of the um, structure and operating mechanisms for a specific marketing strategy that could be adopted in, uh, by each of the GSAs. So any, uh, so uh, first of all, I wanted to ask is, uh, Aaron, can you see? Uh, I can't quite see everyone. Is Valerie with us? Um, not, okay. not, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can circle back. So then, without getting more direction from um, the legal team at this point, um, are there any questions about the coordination that's underway? So that each of the teams is working on specific chapters of the final water marketing strategy. Uh, there is coordination between the teams with clearly defined uh, roles and responsibilities. You've seen a rough outline that takes us through the end of 2022. Um, are there any questions about um, teams, about their individual work products, about the coordination uh, or about the timeline for those things? Joe, did you want to make a comment on my screen? For some reason, your um, window lit up, but we're not hearing anything. Yeah, well, I, I just had a question um, about, uh, and I'm sure Johnny has spoken to you about this, correct, Aaron, uh, Johnny Gailey? And where, in reference to this, you know, uh, how would you say uh, land retirement, if you will, uh, uh, by offering bids and so on to the different GSAs and how might that interact with this or would we be able to facilitate that as well for people, you know, unknowing of what the amount of actual water they're going to have and, and what, you know, what uh, bucket it's coming out of and so on, but who could basically say, I'll, I'll retire my ground for one year, three years, five years, whatever the case may be, uh, and these people putting this ground up and there being kind of a reverse auction, if you will, so that the lowest price uh, land or the, you know, the least cost for the per, per acre foot, if you should say water in particular management areas or zones and so on could be retired and then that water be reallocated over the, over the entire GSA. Uh, are you familiar with that? Has anybody brought that up and 
Yeah. yeah, Johnny Johnny shared the the spreadsheets with me, and and I think it was um, kind of advertised in, as an alternative to the water marketing strategy. Whereas I think I describe it more like what you said, Joe. It's probably an option within the water marketing strategy because, um, and it, it might happen. It's more of a GSA driven auction, whereas the water marketing strategy is more of a grower to grower. So I think that. Um, it can be discussed within the realms, but not a replacement or alternative to a water marketing strategy. No, I'm not. I'm not referring to it as an alternative to, but I'm referring to it as a, as an additive or an, an yep. enhancement to that. Because yep. ultimately, you know, because in the water marketing strategy, we're we're our net gain is zero, in essence, in terms of water moving from here to there. Whereas in this other methodology, what you're doing is you're actually getting people who are volunteering their ground saying, I'm going to idle this ground. And for that, I'd like to be reimbursed. And, and, I, and, and I we need it. to use the rules and standards and so on in terms of direction of movement and all those kinds of things in terms of, you know, that you would be that you would develop in this plan to be able to facilitate that. Yeah, we can definitely incorporate it, but I think it's such a big program. It becomes, it needs to really be its own management action. Set. I wouldn't want to embed it within the water marketing strategy because it's such a critical tool or big enough tool to stand on its own. But like you said, I think it's a, it needs to be discussed within the realm of the water marketing strategy possibly so that if the, when, if a, a reverse auction on land retirement comes into place, it has to follow, it, it's going to utilize the water marketing strategy rules. So they have to go in parallel. I, I get what you're saying. So I think what, what we ought to do is as we start, uh, have Johnny um, present that to the water marketing strategy team in the future. And uh, Aaron, a couple of comments. Uh, uh, so obviously following programs are being considered all over the state by GSPs all, or GSAs all over the state. Uh, there are a number as um, Aaron alluded to, that are considering both a water marketing strategy and, and that what they're calling fall, you know, following programs um, as separate management actions. Uh, what's interesting is that there is an interface between the two. You know, if you if if it's a if it's a temporary following program, you you pay a grower not to grow an acre of land for one year. Um, it is it is a kind of water market. You know, one of the things that you need to uh, keep in mind. But but it, what's interesting is that. You know, uh, if, if you want to secure 10 acre feet of water, you can ask a grower to forego two acres of you know, fallow two acres for the next year and you retire all of the water use on those two acres and you might get 10 acres, uh, you know, depending on the allocation. Uh, you can also get 10 acres by um, having uh, eight, a much larger acreage area that has a thousand acres of water use cut 10% of its water use over the entire area, right? And so there are, um, there are certain efficiency gains from the second example, getting a larger acreage to cut 10%, right? They can actually often achieve the water reductions at much lower cost, right? They can implicate, you know, deficit irrigate or, or imp implement irrigation efficiencies or other ways of, reducing their water use take by 10%. And the total cost of that 10 acre feet tends to be less. The challenge is, and the reason I think a lot of basins are considering fouling programs is that there is uncertainty about whether or not you will get everyone to cut 10%. You know, a voluntary market structure um, creates incentives, um, but you may, there's no guarantee you get the 10 acre feet that you need. Whereas a following program gives you certainty, but it generally provides the water at, at higher co total cost. There's also, uh, this is one that has been discussed widely in Fox Canyon. There's another challenge with fallowing programs, which is that uh, it's clear where the cost comes from. The GSA pays the cost in most cases to uh, secure that additional water, but it, it's unclear what the distribution of benefits is. Once you secure that 10 acre feet, how do you decide who gets access to that 10 acre feet? Uh, and there can be some um, there can be some uh, fairness and equity um, debates. Um, whereas with a voluntary water market, 
it's very clear who's paying the cost and who's getting the benefits. The so costs and benefits are assigned more clear. So those are some of the, um, the issues that I've seen in the interaction between these two different uh, management actions, a, a voluntary water market and a following program. I, I think though, if you if you regionalize or if you set up your your areas as defined in your marketing scheme, if you set those areas up, where in other words, if somebody in John Doe and in in in, in uh, management area one says uh, he would put his ground up, or you know, what I'm talking about. In other words, if you if you solicit people in various areas. And then those benefits go basically are derived by the people in their surrounding areas. I think it it uh, it, it basically is pretty straightforward and and it, uh, how would you say it eliminates a lot of the bidding up and so on that may have to occur in a marketing situation. I'm not saying do away with marketing I'm, by any stretch of the imagination. What I'm saying is, though, I think that there may be there. You may have situations where you have growers who say my kids aren't interested in farming anymore. I've got this ground here. I, I'm going to pull these trees out. I'll just retire it. And if I can get a decent revenue, a rental income, if you will, I'll let that ground go for that. Yeah. And uh, and we can acquire the water for the benefit of everybody around. Yeah, I think I, I think what we need to do, and and, and I, I just saw it yesterday, literally after I got on my board meetings, Johnny, I unpackaged it or went to the link about nine o'clock at night. So there was nothing I could do with it in preparation for today. I think what we ought to do is, is at our next committee meeting, have Johnny give us a presentation on, on his proposal so that the committee can hear what the option is. I'm sure many of you haven't heard of a reverse auction before, but um, I know some basins have used it very successfully. I know Matthew in the, uh, I've talked a lot with um, uh, in the um, Pajaro, uh, Borrego. Uh, Borrego is doing that. Well, and and uh, the more more so, I talked to Brian Lockwood in the Pajaro yeah. uh, Valley, and they yeah. have a very successful reverse auction. Uh, <laughs> I, I like Johnny's name for it better, but we 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 uh, we traipse on some uh, uh, politically correct terms, but I like it better. Uh, it's interesting, but we'll we'll Johnny, we'll put you up on the next. I think can you give us a presentation maybe at the next uh, committee meeting? Yeah, that'd be no problem. And, and I think um, I like your term for the white area ground better as the uh, groundwater dependent uh, farming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was, can, people were, I remember early in the Sigma days that people didn't really understand what white area meant that confused everybody, sent some people on a, what, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and, uh, hey, and uh, one, one comment I wanted to add too is that, um, so this idea of a reverse auction, and by the way, in that same committee, the next committee meeting when we present this, we should also just sort of take a step back and just talk about basic terminology and basic structures. What do we mean? What does a reverse auction mean? Uh, and how is that different than other pricing strategies in markets? Um, just so everyone, so it's clear what that means. A reverse auction obviously is that, ev is that everyone posts their offer, what it is that they want, they're willing to sell for, and then the person who has the lowest offers is sold first. Uh, and so that's a reverse auction. You can do this on land. So you, we, we, wanna re, we wanna retire water use on 10 acres. And so everyone offers their price and the person who's willing to sell their 10 acres for the least is the first to sell. Um, that price structure is very, very successful. And actually it is not unique. Reverse auctions are not unique to following programs and, and land retirement programs. We actually use a reverse auction strategy in the pricing scheme in Fox Canyon. So, so water markets in general can have the same pricing where people post offers and the lowest offer is the first one to sell. Uh, and so the, the, this will be part of the menu of options that are presented to the committee about specific rules, standards, and procedures uh, for a potential water market. Matthew, if, if I can add to you for the committee, if there's terms that you've heard that you'd like us to provide definitions for, can you email Matthew, Craig, Jeremy, or I, and we can create, uh, I know uh, I know for our board, we have to always present them with uh, a lot of times on the agendas, we, we add, you'll see definitions because we technicians use terminology and it's not fair to you folks that we shortcut a lot of things. So 
if you've heard terms out there that you'd like us to define for you, uh, please let us know. Well, that, I think that's a good exercise. Yeah, great. And, and there may be competing terms and we'll need to reconcile when three things, there's three different terms for the same, for the same uh, idea. Yeah, and, and Johnny, for your information, I, I had talked a lot with uh, Brian Lockwood over in the Pajaro Valley has a reverse auction and they work very well for a, it's a specific uh, agent. It's, it's if you're looking at the intended use from an agency to a landowner, it's a, a very powerful tool because as an agency, we're trying to minimize costs. You flip the scenario and when you look from a grower's perspective and and, and then go outward, right? Not from a grower's perspective, they want a traditional auction because they want the highest value. So I think what we creatively need to do is find the opportunities where each one works and, and give our growers and our agencies the most options. So I think, I think we're headed for that direction. So it'll be a good exercise for us to talk about this uh, at the next meeting. Great, yeah, that's awesome, great idea. Hey, and I noticed Valerie's on, can, Craig, can we back up to the, the uh, legal team. How can, we time that, how can we time that any better, right, Matthew? Thanks, Johnny, for, for the discussion. <laughs> so, uh, and so you can go to slide seven. And so, Valerie, we uh, introduced the basic idea. Actually, sorry, go to six real quick, uh, Craig, uh, up one. So, Valerie, welcome, and thank you for joining us with your incredibly busy schedule. Um, we talked, we mentioned, we simply mentioned to the committee that you would be coming in and talking about the legal team's work that they'll be doing to support the water marketing strategy. Uh, I identified that in the original scope of work, there were two specific um, activities. One was writing a chapter, uh, analyzing water rights within the marketing strategy, and then a separate chapter, developing the legal framework for adopting a particular water marketing strategy. And so uh, I have simply mentioned that those are two work products the legal team will be uh, developing. And so if you want to go to seven, uh, the next slide, Craig, um, Valerie, I'd love you to just elaborate a little bit on what you see the role of the legal teams in this process. Sure. Thanks. Um, that's right. So I, I think that um, there are two components, like uh, you just said, and, and one is this chapter of kind of rules, guidelines. Um, I, it, that's surprisingly not terribly contentious, but it will require kind of all council getting together, the council and legal team. So council for each of the GSAs talking about what rules we, we need to address in the basin and what exactly those rules are. I think that's going to be kind of a narrative chapter. My sense is we'll go back and forth with that legal team. We'll probably present it to the policy folks, um, but, but I don't think that that's going to take as much back and forth or as much input from um, the, the committee and, and the other teams as probably the more interesting and, and second part, um, which is really this risk analysis component. Um, so the process is that we're going to call, you know, we're going to come up with the rules. That's that first um, bullet point on this. And then the second component is look at market components, the who, what, where, when, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then basically those risks in an ideal world, we'd bring to the policy team, the committee and say, here's, for example, on who, here's the risk of including this person. Here's the risk of not including this person. Here's the risk of, you know, allowing this person to, and when I mean person, I mean, you know, specific water right holder. Um, to participate in the market. And if you don't allow their participation, this is the risk you may see too. There's always going to be trade-offs. Um, and, and of course, we'll tell you those trade-offs, but in the end, that's a call that the, that the committee and the other teams are going to have to make. Um, but hopefully, we will, we will tee that up in a way that people really understand it and have a robust discussion about it. So um, I guess that's the process is rules, risk analysis and bring that risk analysis to the policy folks. Um, next slide, if you want me to talk a little bit about kind of how I think risk analysis will go. Um, and, and again, these are the components probably of a market. And when I say a market, I, I sort of mean an allocation too, so that hopefully people understand the distinction between those and aren't. it's not too confusing. 
but there will be a lot of questions about how how the market is developed, who is eligible to participate. For example, a lot of markets just assume everyone's an overlier. Okay, so you have a couple different types of water right holders. And in our basin, given the facts, is it smart to just say everyone's an overlier? Is there room for appropriative water right holders? And if so, how do we treat those folks? Um, do we want to include surface water right holders, in lieu users, prescriptive claimants? You know, in a basin that has a lot of overdraft and a lot of municipal use, prescription really kind of claims the day. I don't think we'll have that here, but um, who is able to participate and, and how we treat prescription in lieu appropriators and overliers and, and um, are all going to be really important components. So hopefully we will have an analysis that says, if you only include overliers and you assume everyone's an overlier and there's no prescription, here's the risk. If you assume there's tons of prescription and everyone's been prescribed, here are the risks. And then we bring that to you guys, explain it, and you tell us um, how to structure the market. The what, what is included, um, a lot of this is, is kind of frankly the bucket issue of what buckets are we including? Are we just marketing a groundwater component or are we able to include um, salvaged foreign water and frankly stored surface water? So is it, is it all water that's underground realizing that it's not all groundwater or do we just limit it to that single bucket? And obviously the risks of limiting to the secret single bucket are that it's a smaller market. It's probably not as helpful on a grower level but if you expand it, you know, you're going to see other risks and uh, get into other issues. So again, ideally, we tee that up of here are your options, here are the risks, and then, and then move forward. Where um, a, a surprisingly um, difficult component of market, do you trade? Are you able to trade with your neighbor? Are you able to trade way across the basin? Are you able to trade in two areas of a basin that are that are foundationally different um, amongst and between aquifers are sometimes a problem out of basin? And are we looking at each GSA as kind of a unit? Um, or are you looking at a landowner as a unit? Um, and, and so those those that geography and how you define who is a trader depends on the geography as well. So if you if you, for example, you could have a market where just you had three traders, three GSAs trading amongst and between each other. I don't think we're going to do that, but you could also do it at an APM level. Um, you could do it at a wellhead level, and that's all kind of geography questions. So again, we'll tee that up, tell you here are your options, here are the risks with those. And then when, um, hopefully this is going to be a forward-looking market. But even in a forward-looking market where you don't have to deal with the historic stored surface water component, if you carry over water, if you don't use water one year, are you allowed to carry it over? If you're allowed to carry it over, is there a diminishing return? Usually there is. How much time can you do that? Um, and really a lot of that has to do with if water's moving, is if it migrates. So um, when you can move water and when you can keep it, those are all interesting questions as well. Those are more technical, but there are legal components. The legal rules on timing, um, there aren't a lot, frankly. So um, you're you're you have kind of a, a wide open, wide open avenue on legal. Um, but when you lose it, and if you can keep it over time, are really are really big issues regarding you know how people will use the market. So again, we'll kind of bring the question to you: If you let people use carryover water forever. Here are the problems you're going to get in dry years. You're going to probably see some serious impacts. Um, and if you let people not carry it over at all, are you going to incentivize people to kind of use water um, in kind of a water buffalo or unreasonable manner? So those are the risks on the on the timing or the temporal component. So um, I, again, that was a lot of information I just went through, but that's that's I think the second and frankly more interesting step is going to be teeing up all of our options and um, the exposure you'll have. And, and just remember that all, all options will have risk. Um, so there's, there's not ever gonna be a, a get out of jail free card probably, but um, hopefully we can all understand those and make decisions based on informed risk.
Um, and to add to that, that commentary real quick, uh, just is because she didn't call out what I think is the most interesting part of the slide, which is we are going to bend rules in the implementation of any water marketing strategy. And so the committee needs to be conscientious about which rules are being bent and how far. Uh, and, and what's interesting uh, it, from my perspective is that Sigma, Sigma and groundwater law don't seem to line up perfectly uh, or at all. Uh, you know, Sigma gives GSA's authority to allocate groundwater and even empowers agencies to authorize transfers of groundwater allocation. But any transfer of groundwater allocation will be bending rules or any other type of. And so I think that's what's most interesting and, and Valerie's framed that so well. Uh, any decision, all the various decision points within the water marketing strategy involve potentially bending rules. And so we need to be conscientious about what we're bending and how far we're bending it. Yep, that's right. That's right. And, and, and again, I guess for me, that kind of comes into the risk component of if this is a hard and fast rule, but we know we have to deviate from it because we can't have our market if we follow it, you know, that those are kind of the the two bookends that a hard and fast rule is harder to break but if you absolutely can't do anything if you don't break it maybe you have to whereas there are going to be some rules that apply in certain circumstances and then and then you're bending rather than totally breaking um but yes that's there there's no doubt that the rigidity of the rules of law would never allow a market um and so Certainly, the idea there is that we all agree to break them together, and and because of that, it creates kind of this settlement or agreed upon departure um, that makes it okay. And that's a follow up question I had for you, Valerie. Is when we talk about bending or breaking rules, who is it's actually bending them? And you said it was, we all do it, but it was actually making the decision. Is it the committee? Is it the GSA? How does that go about? Well, I mean, I think I, I actually, that's an interesting question. I think that the GSA, the committee through the GSA sets up the market. And I think that the people who participate in the market are the rule breakers. Um, and, and I, but, but I think we have to disclose that. We have to say, uh, <laughs> that's funny, Chuck Nichols. Um, uh, I, 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 but I, I think when you sign up and we're going to have to have the, the most, and the most boring part of this is going to be you know, the participants who sign up are also gonna to have to agree to certain things. And really it's their agree to walk away from the rules. Maybe that's the nicest way to, to put it. And, and for people who don't wanna participate and don't wanna break those rules, you know, that's, that's a who question. Can we allow people not to participate? But that, that'd be my sense is that we're setting up a construct and people are gonna to have to agree if they're going to participate it, in it to accept the rule bending. Um, and Valerie, I uh, one question, and, and I see Manuel's comment, which I want to make sure that we address uh, in the chat. But um, uh, one question I have is, uh, are the allocation systems that are going to be developed, whether or not they're, they're um, whether or not they are part of a, whether or not a water marketing strategy is adopted, are any of these rule bent, is any of this rule bending inherent in devising allocation systems and allocation flexibility? Like is a carryover provision, is that, are, are all of those potential provisions consistent with water law uh, or, or will allocation systems in general challenge existing water rights? Well, um... The, so the allocation system is going to be as close as you can to following rules of of water right. So, but you're not like any. It, it's it's sort of like a mini. I don't want to say the word adjudication because it gets you know people nervous. But it's really telling people what cards they're being dealt, and and people are going to argue about that as we've talked about. That's going to be the most contentious part. You want to try to stick as close as you can to the rules on that. However, you're gonna to have to put people in categories and they're gonna, for example, overliers. And overliers are senior. They're senior to appropriators and uh, they're senior to everyone but Pueblo rights. So they should all get served first. And we should try to make sure we respect that. Now, maybe we have such overdraft in the basin that we don't even need to worry about appropriators. 
because there's not even, there's never enough supply to even supply overliers. That's a call to make. And if we make that call and you have an appropriator who says that's wrong, you know, it, it's, it's going to be difficult and you're going to deal with that. You're going to have to have facts to back that up. So I think when it comes to the allocation, you want to stick as close as you can to the rules, but you're going to have to categorize people and, um, and make decisions based on facts. Some people will like that. Some people may challenge it, but that is the part where people are most likely to, to challenge their allocation probably more than than the marketing structure. But again, I, I, I think that's where you try to stick as close as you can to following, following the rules. Where you get to break the rules more often is the, the trading part. I don't, I, I don't know if that fully answered your question. No, but that's yeah, and I, I, yeah. I agree the, 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 experience, the limited experience I have is that, is that the allocation is what's contentious and that it's not hard, you know, that, that there's generally consensus around how and when to bend the rules in the service of transfers of allocation within the market. Right? Yeah, well, and, it, and part people, of that- People is, are gonna challenge their categorization in the allocation. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and if you think about it, I just thought of this, so maybe it's not a great analogy, but the market is kind of fun. The market is kind of the spending your money. The, the less fun part is how you earn or how you're allocated that money. And, and um, so I think people are more excited about trading it because it allows you to maximize what you have. But when you're being told what you have, that's really the, obviously the part that's most contentious. And, right. Or, or uh, sometimes what you don't have. That right. You thought you right. Had. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So questions about what Valerie has discussed? Did Manuel have a question? I think you said Manuel had a question. Yeah, so his, uh, well, so uh, his uh, is related. He said, how would the emergency allocation system work in tandem with the water allocations being developed by the GSAs? And I think you're gonna very different things. The emergency allocation will end, but go ahead. What, uh, you wanna address that, Aaron? Yeah, Manuel, they, they are not intended. That's what we're trying to be. And I, I, Sophie brought up this point and we need to be very clear on it. The, the, the reason why we in the mid queer are doing what we're doing is to address the ongoing drought and the decline in groundwater levels. Um, and it, it, it does not, um, in, it is not meant to be the long-term allocation system, but one why, by which we're trying to make a quick adjustment uh, in 2022 to ensure that we have enough water to put into a, an allocation system in the future and a water market. So um, the idea is to just have it in place up until October 2022, the mid quia board will reevaluate the groundwater conditions and then make a decision. The goal is to get to the water accounting framework as our allocation system, that three bucket um, system and that is uh, awaiting that the work that our engineers are talking about in the water budget and the model. So again, you saw the schedule for that. That schedule puts us out in the 2023 time period. So I would say my my assumption right now is that 2023 we might still be under an emergency ordinance. But by 2024 we'll be evaluating the water accounting framework as our allocation platform. And that that is being incorporated into this discussion of the water marketing strategy, not the emergency ordinances. Sharon, thanks for the explanation. Eric Williams, you had a question in here. I'm not sure if it's already been answered. Do you want to go on camera and uh, <coughs> provide more discussions on that? Or? Sure. This was a, thanks, Craig. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is a question for Valerie. Valerie, as far as uh, bending the rules go, is there an option or has anybody tried some sort of stipulated agreement? And I don't know what sort of legal basis or legal weight a stipulated agreement has. If you said, great, the, the vast majority of people in the basin have stipulated that these are the rules we are going to bend and maybe even get a judge to say, okay, I will accept that everybody stipulates that. Does that carry legal weight or is that an option to go forward? Yeah, so um, 
I mean, in any adjudication, usually adjudications, frankly, end in settlements. And those are just agreements. That's an agreement right. to be to, to accept your allocation as you've kind of negotiated it. Hopefully we're not <laughs> doing that. And, and I think the agreement that I probably see, although we haven't worked this out entirely, is if you want to participate in the market, you will agree with everything. Now, granted, that that's not, I'm not saying that that's, we should leverage that. I'm saying we need to work really hard on making everyone comfortable with it. So they're happy to sign that. I don't, I don't mean it as if you want to participate in this market, you'll, you know, you'll stand down on everything that you don't like. Ideally, you would have something that looked similar to an, a, an adjudication structure, which is everyone participates, everyone knows what's going on. You agree to the, the allocation. And in order to participate in the market, you agree not to challenge the market. Now, the trick there is there are people who might not want to participate in the market and might feel like they've been treated poorly in the allocation, in which case they could always do a quiet title action and you could go to adjudication. But ideally, you would create something that everyone could live with. And then when you participate in the market, you sign a market participant agreement that says you're not going to challenge it. You accepted this and you understand how you're treated. You understand what you can trade. And if, if it works like that, then there is no challenge. If people want to challenge it, you basically, they don't get to participate in the market. I, I, guess, one of my, I guess one of my questions though is, is agreeing to the market different than agreeing to the allocation? Uh, agreeing to the market is agreeing to bend the rules. Agreeing to the allocation is agreeing to the amount of water you can sell. Are those two different issues? They are two different issues, but I think in order to participate in the market, you would have to agree to the allocation as well. Because the allocation is really a foundation of, okay. of what you're putting into the market. Okay. And so uh, Derek said in Fox Canyon, we had the, we had the interesting situation that um, to be participate in the market, individuals actually had to opt into an allocation. This was in, in the early days, opt into a market allocation that was different than their allocation if they weren't in the market. And we did that through you know, contractual arrangement. They, they agree, they commit to not challenge that. We say, here's your allocation if you're in the market. We agree not to challenge that. Um, in order to have access to the market. Um, now, independent of that, independent of having two allocation systems, we're now in a situation where we, where the market allocation is the same as the allocation if you're outside the market. Uh, and there, the challenge, the, the risk of someone challenging the allocation um, exists whether or not um, a GSA chooses to implement a water marketing strategy. And in fact, uh, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, we are now undergoing adjudication in each of the basins. But interestingly, no one's challenging the market structure. They're challenging the allocation system. Just as a reminder, folks, that as you're seeing the, this uh, discussion and the legal and the probably brings up the most. And again, uh, this is just how we're going to approach it. The real work comes and we will be infusing the other two legal counsels, Aubrey Morrison and Joe Hughes. So you're going to have a pretty deep uh, bench and talented folks. And we're going to, unfortunately or fortunately, ground these things down to the point where we've, we, you know, again, you're going to get the, the options, the risks, and then make the decision. I think it's a good platform, but we have a lot of discussion ahead. <laughs> And, and now, Valerie, I, I think that um, we'll have to get probably going quicker rather than let, leave these to the end. So I, I was commenting to a few folks on the side, we'll be setting up a legal team meeting here um, as soon as possible to, to bring these topics up. Yep, I think that's good. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work and... Um... They're, they're, although the rules may be easier, the, the risks, again, more, more interesting, more fun, but uh, more difficult. So I, I think that's good. And, and I've always advertised, and I know Valerie, uh, we've talked about this a lot. There's things that we're going to have to do that may not fit within the 
uh, confines of all the laws, regu- I mean, how many are out there? How many do we not know about? How many are we capturing? But if we achieve sustainability uh, in the Kuya Subbasin, I mean, that's, that's what we're after. Um, and, I, and to me, we're looking at sustainability of our groundwater and all of our beneficial users, our communities and our economy. So it's, you know, we have a broad umbrella, but I think with the folks that we have here, I think that's, we can get there. Um, a lot of, we're gonna have a lot of discussion, a lot of input, but I think we can get there. Craig did bring up a good point to me is that we need to be clear. Um, the allocation system is, is something that the GSAs are, are tasked with. So that it's at their level. And so this water marketing strategy will have to work with the allocation system as defined and developed by the, the GSAs. Yep. Hey, yeah, Craig, as a transition, do you mind going to slide 14 real quick? Uh, <laughs> sort of motivate the next activity. Um, so obviously what you've seen today is, is this broad introduction where the legal team is gonna present you with a series of options and the risks associated with each of those. And, and the number of options is, is, uh, are, are many. Uh, as we, based on the allocation system that the engineering team helps GSAs to develop, the combination of the options from the legal team, the, the allocation system, and then uh, a menu of choices from existing markets, the committee will be presented with uh, uh, a large number of choices. You know, some of them I, I outlined here in the bullet points. Right and things, ha- uh, you know, what are enforcement mechanisms? You know, the administrative functions of actual transfers. How do those happen? Um, how does someone qualify to be a participant? You know, etc. All of these things. There's many, many, many decisions. And so, what we'd like to do, uh, and obviously, based on all these decisions, you you should already have a sense that that there could potentially be that that there are dozens and dozens of potential, uh, different potential markets, right? Based on each of these decision points, the who, what, where, when, how, all of those things. And so uh, we want to have a systematic approach to making decisions about what a specific water marketing strategy in Kuya Subbasin will look like, right? And so we, uh, and so if you go to the next slide now, Craig, um, and, and the, you can actually go to the one after that, um, my urgent recommendation is that you start from first principles, right? What is it that you hope to accomplish with the marketing strategy? What is it, what is essential that we avoid? And that you develop specific goals and objectives that will guide decision-making, right? So that you can always refer back to those original principles uh, when confronted with uh, a series of choices. Um, as an example of this, uh, um, I wanna highlight the work that was done in Fox Canyon um, their stakeholders met for seven months. It was, it was directly um, led by stakeholders. And, and the first two months or so, we're actually debating goals and objectives. What is it that we hope to accomplish? And what is important to stakeholders? And, and in fact, not just what are some um, explicit goals and objectives, but what is the, if we're to force rank those, what are the highest priority goals and objectives? And so uh, I've represented here um, what those original choices were made by stakeholders in Fox Canyon. The, the primary goal that everyone identified was to provide water users with flexibility in the face of reduced water supplies. Uh, I'll add to that uh, um, a, a, uh, to go along with that, it was also flexibility also meant flexibility to help water users comply with new GSP requirements. Um, one of the other goals was to incentivize conservation and creation of new supplies, right? To actually discover what the value of water is uh, in order to support, in order to incentivize conservation and actually support development of new projects. Um, in Fox Canyon, stakeholders um, wanted to do better than doing no harm, right? So one way to approach uh, implementation of a market is to aspire to allow transfers and to anticipate potential impacts to third parties and make sure that there is no harm done to the environment and um, disadvantaged communities and other third parties. We actually hoped to do better than that in Fox Canyon, that actually market, voluntary market transfers would actually produce better outcomes in uh, the basin, that, that it would actually 
positively affect the distribution of water quality at water levels. Uh, and so, and that is to say transfer pumping out of the most sensitive areas. And, uh, and so that was a, the, the third priority goal in all this. Um, stakeholders felt very, very, very strongly that, um, that trading needed to be neutral with respect to land use patterns. This is a Ventura County specific thing. We're acutely concerned about um, conversion of ag land to urban development, you know, sitting at the edge of the, metro, the Los Angeles metropolitan area. Uh, we don't want to see farms paved over. Uh, and so that was a very regionally specific goal. Uh, and then stakeholders were also very, very concerned that market activity would be fair and transparent. They worried in particular about the undue influence of really, really large allocation holders and really powerful multinational agribusinesses. Uh, and so they define transparency and fairness in a particular way. You see some of those things there, reduction of market power, mitigation of third party impacts, uh, reduction of transaction costs. These were the parameters uh, for defining what is fair. And then each of these goals or objectives actually produced specific decisions. If you'll go to one, the next slide, Craig, uh, and we don't need to go through the details of what that market looks like, but each goal suggested a particular decision about the structure and operational mechanisms of the market. And so goals and objectives um, led directly to a particular market that looks different than, than um, any other market that we're aware of in the Western United States, right? And it's because of the specific goals and objectives identified by stakeholders. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, Craig, um, we already heard, so uh, after the uh, first committee meeting and, or sorry, the first public workshop, uh, we did uh, a, in November, we did a, a uh, uh, two hours that were just open office hours, stakeholders and committee members could drop in uh, and share their perspectives, their, their goals and aspirations and their concerns. Uh, and so this is just as a starting point, we're gonna, we're gonna wipe this blank here in a minute uh, and start with a clean slate. We wanted to share with you some of the things we heard from stakeholders in those um, November 10 office hours. Um, not surprisingly, growers, uh, growers in particular identified the need for flexibility as one of the primary goals. Um, uh, that, that they were going to need flexibility in the face of reduced water supplies. Um, we heard from one grower in particular that, that that flexibility was going to be especially important in white areas. Uh, we heard a number of water users um, explain that the current drought, the current situation um, required flexibility um, and that what flexibility meant to stakeholders was the ability to lease someone else's allocation, someone else's access to water separate from the land. So leasing water independent of having to lease the ground. Uh, that was how, uh, that was one way that water users defined flexibility in those office hours. We also heard um, the need to avoid unintended consequences for the environment. And this is an example actually that Soapy offered during those office hours. Um, she had heard that um, in a neighboring basin that was using ET based monitoring that growers were actually planning to forego cover crops in order to um, uh, improve their ET reading uh, that, the, that the satellite remote sensing produces, right? And so this is not, this is not a, a consequence of transfers, this is a consequence of monitoring and uh, allocations, but there are potentially uh, harmful effects uh, for soil health here, but for, for uh, environmental outcomes broadly. Uh, and so avoiding those unintended consequences was a, a goal identified in the November 10 office hours. Another talked, uh, at, at least two different stakeholders in those office hours um, identified uh, the goal of taking an adaptive approach. Uh, the, the two proposed almost opposing approaches to adaptation. One said, well, we should just start really, really, really broadly. You know, we should have fairly unrestricted transfers. And then at, over time, as impacts are identified, will narrow down the, the scope of transfers, will impose restrictions in response to those impacts. Another in the office hour said, well, no, we should do the exact opposite. We should start simple, start small, learn as we go, and then get more complex over time. Uh, and then uh, another stakeholder highlighted the importance that in order for a water market to be uh, used, to be useful to all stakeholders, 
that information about the water marketing strategy and about any market that results, uh, access to, uh, you know, uh, to, to the process of trying to qualify and participate in the market, that all of that needs to be conducted in Spanish uh, in order to be um, effective in uh, the CUIA subbasin. So these are some of the things that have already been discussed by committee members and stakeholders uh, in this process. And so what we wanted to do now was just engage uh, in an activity of just starting to define all of the things that, that committee members hope to accomplish, all of the things that uh, committee members hope to avoid in, a, in uh, were a water market to be implemented within a GSA uh, in the Quia subbasin. And then over time, we'll refine those, you know, uh, we'll actually prioritize those and the goal is in, in a future meeting is to get the committee to agree to um, a specific set of goals and objectives that we can use going forward to guide development of the marketing strategy. And with that, I'm going to pass um, this off to Craig, and Craig will uh, discuss how this will work. So uh, if you haven't already, um, go ahead and go to your computers and uh, add in this uh, URL, the tinyurl.com, Kalia JB01. And in here, you'll see uh, essentially three slides. If you're not familiar with Jamboards, I'll go ahead and do a quick tutorial on it. But we have, uh, looks like somebody's added a fourth slide already. So what we have is, um, what we want you to do is add a sticky note with your thought on this various topic. We have the one water market strategy accomplish, what it's to avoid, and this third one's blank right now. And what we want you to do is go ahead and add in your thoughts as a sticky note. You can pick any color you want. If you see a sticky note that you like the idea or the concept, uh, drag and drop the check mark over the top of it, more or less vote it up. Uh, if you see one that you don't really like, put the X mark on it. So we'll spend about five minutes about having you start inserting those ideas now. And um, we'll have a conversation around each of those. We'll probably look at those that have the most votes or most uh, uh, dislikes, and then we'll, uh, uh, discuss those. So if you haven't done Jamboard before, it is very simple. You have your menu down here on the left. The sticky note function is this one right here. So you'll just click on it. It'll open up a window. You can pick the color that you like. You'll enter in your, your, uh, your note. And then just save. You can keep adding this if you want. You can drag them around. If you want to duplicate anything, you click on these three dots. It'll let you duplicate or delete or edit um, your, your uh, sticky note. Same thing works here for uh, these icons. You just click in here, you can duplicate. If there's a different image you want to add in, it's pretty simple. You click on add an image and you can uh, search it through your browser. So if you like a different uh, check mark, go right ahead. Um, one thing to note on all these is that the sticky notes are anonymous. You can put these anywhere you like. Uh, you can put them in, you don't have to have your name associated with it. But if you want to have your name associated with it, just put in your initials. Um, my colleague, Andrea Clark, is on the line here. She's taking the notes for today. So when we get to the point where we're talking about an item, we, we may ask people to get elaborative on what it meant to them. And then we'll capture that into the meeting summary. And uh, Craig, let me add real quick. Um, I would like you to be as discreet as possible in this sense. I mean something very specific by discreet, like break down goals and objectives into the smallest unit possible. So there's a great one there, equitable water market that is protective of drinking water. I would consider that two discrete goals. Equitable market, because equitable market it may include protective of drinking water users, but it's broader. So make sure you put two different ones um, one for equitable market, one for protective of drinking water users. Uh, and then again, Craig, do you want to show real quick? Uh, and, and obviously, if someone has put a, a if someone has put up a um, sticky note that you like, drag a drag a um, check mark over onto that, and so that we can count the number of check marks um, on each. Put these on the right page here. So again, if you have ones that you have that you want the, the process to accomplish or avoid, start adding those in here.
obviously you can duplicate checks by clicking on the three dots in the top right corner. And it's working, folks. We're we're seeing stuff. Don't and again, it's it's fully anonymous. Don't be shy. This is where we get to work, and this is where it, this sort of effort makes a difference early in the game, right? So this is where we set the standard, and and then we can work from there. So. And no, Aaron won't be providing any. <laughs> this is purely stakeholder driven, not staff driven. Simplicity, yes. What happened there? If, if there are folks without um, any ability to use a computer, uh, what I would encourage is um, if, you're, if you would like to submit one and you're comfortable submitting it, uh, add it to the chat and then we can, I can put it up or you're more than welcome to email me and I'll put, uh, and I will keep your comment um, uh, anonymous and I'll put my email up in the uh, chat. Or um, if you even want to text me, I'll put my cell phone number in the chat too. Or you can just shout it out on the call and we'll report it there too. And I'll probably follow up with Soapy. I know Soapy had to get on the road, so I'll, I'll probably follow up with her separately to see if she has any thoughts. I didn't know you can rotate the check marks, but I see that, interesting. Uh So I can provide a half a uh, uh, eh, check mark. <laughs> Maybe some feedback from the committee members. Do you like this Jamboard option? I see people working on it. So we, we might use this tool in the future. I've used it on um, some work that I've been doing and, and um, I've seen it have huge benefits. It's, it's anonymous, people, people seem to enjoy having the ability to put their thoughts on paper. Hey Craig, so so when you when you say you put the X on something, you don't like that? Yes. Well, I think that's that was... something we need to talk about here on uh, with watermark and stretch and void on the X mark here. You're emphasizing that you don't like 
you don't like water speculation. That would be the question, whoever put that X there. Is that, are you saying you uh, support you trading large quantities of water or you just, or you are opposed to that tax? I'm, I'm gonna take, assume, unless somebody tells me differently, that the X emphasizes that they want to avoid water speculation. Yeah, okay, so we should adopt as a convention, checks mean you support that claim. So we want, if you want to avoid water speculation and you agree we should avoid water speculation, put a check there. So this changed from an uh, X to a check. Yeah, so an X, so, so, and there might be someone who doesn't want to avoid water speculation. And then you would put an X if you do not want to avoid water speculation. <laughs> There's economists that say that all the benefits come from speculation. I'm not one of them, but they're, they're okay. cut out. That's out there. So if whoever put the X in there disagrees with me moving these around, please change it. Yep, oh, two of them became, all right, there we go. Excellent, excellent. Oh, and I see a hand. There's a check there over simplicity. Okay. Maybe we can continue on this idea generation and voting. Um, what I'm thinking we would do is have this continually open, say through Friday, and people can continually add on to it. And we'll um, what we don't get to today, we'll have as part of our conversation or next committee meeting, where it makes sense within the agenda. Um, and so. Matthew, is there anything here that jumps out to you you want to have a broader discussion on, or should we just go by the number of check marks? Well, I do think some of this, um, you know, first of all, I, I actually think it would be valuable, um, uh, and we can talk about whether we're going to do this today or at the, at, as the start of the next meeting. It would be valuable to what, what these things mean to each person, uh, because um, um, People might be, for example, transferring transferability that is evaluated on a case by case basis rather than a one size fits all. What what do you mean by one size fits all or case to case? Um, uh, you know, so some of these I think require. Um, so, you know, it would be great to hear what people what they mean by that because the same sticky might mean something different to two different people. And then the other one is that some of these also I think need more, um, it, it would be great to create, you know, bullet points underneath what, uh, that are more specific. Um, so hey, Matthew, adequate, adequate occlusion of DAX. Well, what does that mean? Um, Matthew, how, I, you know, yeah. I, I think to maintain the uh, anonymity of the, the process, yeah. I think what you, uh, what we ought to do as the team is put this together in a, in a list yeah. format and, and yeah. define how we read it and then have the committee react to it to try and maintain Excellent. that because it, it removes the anonymity of it. Yeah, uh, great. But I think that allows us time to shuffle this list, understand it, each individual ones. And I think at the next committee, you're absolutely right. This is agenda item number one. Look, here's the list. We can even categorize it, show the emphasis, the priorities, which one came out on top, which ones had, um, um, and then, and then people can, uh, we can uh, have people um, uh, fix items that we may have uh, interpreted incorrectly. Yeah, great, excellent. I like it. I'm just trying to protect the the, and I think it th this does work when you when you give people the ability to add their thoughts without any risk. They, the thoughts come out, and that's where we've got all of it on paper here.
it, it's even one of those things too in the processes that I've used. It's one of those, it starts to snowball. One person puts one up and then it starts generating more and that's what's happened here. This is great. I guess while many of the committee members are are adding their um, thoughts there, I maybe ought to provide a quick little update on uh, what we're seeing in the CLIA subbasin. And I know we've got our consultants, and I believe um, is um, oh maybe. Um, it looks like Greater Kuya, um, Eric Osterling had to drop off, but just for everybody's information, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. I'm gonna, I think, yeah, I think it was Craig's mic. Um, uh, the the sub basin has received a notification letter from the Department of Water Resources regarding our, our GSP. Um, that, that letter really, simply states that our, our evaluation is substantially complete and that we're anticipating an evaluation, um, official evaluation, um, probably in, in January, just ahead of the deadline of January 31st. Um, they've identified that we have deficiencies in our, our GSP. And I think my only um, comment on that is, is in, in my analysis of what's happening, um, the incomplete in my mind, even as a person who is um, participating in the development of our GSP, we, we knew going in that there were issues that we were gonna need to address. And in the Kauia Subbasin, the three GSAs have already begun to address those. So I would say we're not in a bad position. We're in a good position to respond to those evaluations. And uh, as with everything else we do with DWR, we believe it's gonna be an interactive process and we'll be collaborating with them to get us to the point where we can respond to their um, concerns and questions on our GSP. But we're, we're nearing the finish line. Um, and so there's gonna be a flurry of activity next year, including this water marketing strategy. It's part of a bigger picture sustainability plan. Uh, and I think the three GSAs are committed to all of this. How we all stitch it together, um, stay tuned because there is a lot on our plates come 2022. Um, but I know that Stantec here, we've set up a good strategy and I think it's gonna kind of operate as planned, so. I would just add with what the East has done, I think we'll have some good data to look at in this next year. As, uh, when you, when you um, as far as a, um, uh, uh, you, using the land IQ and a, overlying a, a, a potential cap, right? Yeah, because they're, you know, they're allowing transfers. So yeah. I think it'll be good to see what how that what quantity is really involved in that amount and what different impacts you may see because of it. Good point. And one thing to bring up, uh, Aaron, I'll work with you on this is on the. Uh, this, we just since we wrapped up the PowerPoint this morning, as well as these documents here and prior PowerPoint presentations, I'll work with you to getting these submitted into DWR to have them translated into Spanish, and then we'll link them on the uh, project website. Yeah, that's a good point, Craig. So we are. I think uh, Matthew brought it up in his slide. He pointed out that there's been a request that we do things in Spanish. Uh, we are uh, this meeting. We couldn't get everything set up in time, but we will we'll be providing translation capabilities. We're still working that out, so. 
I think one of the options we're trying to do, right, Craig, is this is being recorded and we will translate the re uh, recorded and have yeah, it yeah, yeah, I've tested it. Um, so since all the videos have been programmed to do the transcription from in the audio transcription, uh, you, the user can select any language they want in their browser window in YouTube to change the language to the language of their choice. So it already works. So I can tell folks to do that if they don't know how. So folks, I think we've we've spent quite a few minutes here and I think it's kind of slowing down on the comments. Um, maybe we ought to, um, unless there's any, again, I think you can always check back in to add something. Let's just say tomorrow morning, you, you think of one that the jam boards will still be up. We're capturing them along the way to make sure they're, um, we get snapshots in time of where the comments are at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll PDF this and turn it all set up. Okay, I'm going to assume these two, two slides here are intended to go together. It's good I'm watching our consultants, Provost and Pritchard. They're not putting any comments in. <laughs> <laughs> Nope. <laughs> I was looking for one that says more consultant work. <laughs> in the avoid, in the avoid mark in the strip. <laughs> well, after we had the comment that it was the consultant's fault with all breaking the rules, I don't know if you want to put that in. <laughs> I was gonna I was thinking about putting something in attribute your name to it in the text, but <laughs> fast enough. <laughs> I think Morgan forgot to also admit that her background is water marketing too. So her expertise is for the group's knowledge. She comes pre-trained with water marketing knowledge. The do's and don'ts. Okay, well, we're at the 1059 mark here on our agenda. Or uh, Mr. Nelson, do you want to kind of wrap up the meeting, then we can adjourn? I think Steve had to get going. Um, okay. So I'll go ahead and thank everybody for, again, another uh, hugely successful 
uh, meeting here um, as we wrap up 2022. And I'll just leave with, I wish you guys all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, we'll see you all probably in 2022 <laughs> because I'm hoping to take a little time off here also uh, ahead of the end of the year. So wish you and your families a, a nice holiday season. Thanks for the, and thank you for the 2022 work, I'm um, 2021 work you guys have uh, put in so far. I look forward to our, our water marketing strategy work next year. And um, continue, if you have any other thoughts, go ahead and check back in with the, the Jamboard. If you need the links again, contact me. Um, and um, we'll be back to you early in the year with the next meeting. What I probably am gonna do too, as I'm thinking through this in 2022, uh, Craig and Matthew and team is, we might wanna just set a hard set schedule. So we block Agreed. out our calendars. So one of the two first things we'll do at the beginning of the year is review these jam boards, priorities, goals, objectives, set a schedule, uh, and then we can just operate from there. Thanks folks. <laughs>